Good day, my online friends. It's Joshua Spencer once again, Joshua Spencer of Toronto. And I just want to share with you an excerpt from my book, From New Mills to New Life. Uh, this book was published in uh, August, in October 2009. Beg your pardon. So um, here we go. This is what the book looks like From New Mills to New Life. Written by Joshua Spencer. From New Mills to New Life. Alright, so I'll be sharing um, a section of the book, pages 179 through to pages uh, 183. So here we go. The night of the 19th of December 1993, my brother, Oliver Nelson, drove me to Darleston to say farewell to my daughters. It was really tough for me and for them too, especially Kadisha. She was really my little pet, being my first child, but I loved them both equally. Kadisha was also with me until she was a little over three years old, so there was a great bond between us than my little sweetie Kalis. Kalisha would have been 10 years later that month. Kalis would have been 7 years in May. We drove into the yard. I tried to exhibit a happy face. I did not want them to see any tears coming from their father. It's a pity they did not know that they had a really emotional cry-cry baby man as their father, I thought. I took my two daughters and held them very closely and let them know that I really loved them. I also told them that I would never forget them. As a matter of fact, I had taken my daughters to, the, to do the medical with me to travel to Canada as well. It was my hope that I would be able to get settled soon and then sponsor them into Canada the same way Cherry had done for me. Would it ever happen? Would I be in a position to realize that dream for my two little girls? It was the hardest night I had ever had in, in all my 34 years. <clears throat> Excuse me. I sat in the back of Oliver's car and it was time to go. When I turned around, I saw Kadisha crying. I felt so hurt inside. There I was. I had already done them wrong by living elsewhere, albeit the same parish and country. And now I was on my way to an overseas country. I thought that they would never forgive me for my actions and promised that I would repay them handsomely one day. December 20, 1993 had arrived. I did not sleep well the night before. I was with my brother, Oliver Nelson, who took me to the Sanchez International Airport. I don't remember if I had told him of what was going on with Cherry and I. Probably I did. Probably I didn't. But it was truly hard leaving my friend, body, tight piece and brother, coupled with my children, Kalish and Kalis. The uncertainties that were ahead of me did not help much either. Oliver helped me with my luggage, and we bade goodbye. The plane was virtually empty. I was able to move from seat to seat. After all, it was December 20. Everyone was heading away from Canada to get rid of the cold, not approaching Canada to meet the cold. I thought about that too. I, quest I questioned where, why it is that my life always seemed to be going in the direction of a Canada when it should have been going towards, say, a Jamaica, or Florida, or Cuba. Why was it always headed for the cold? I said to myself that it had been warm days, though. There had been th those days that I danced as a five-year-old for the customers at my father's establishment on Hart Street in Mobile. There had also been those days that I felt so lucky to share the friends that I had, especially those whom I had met during my years at Sam Sharp Teachers College. I thought also about those warm days when it seemed I was heading to a tropical country when Mr. and Mrs. Thompson came into my life. I said, yes, there have been some warm days. Warm days when I met my newly found on-campus friend who took me to see her parents, and some warm days and temperatures when I met my sweetheart was now studying in a Canadian university. Even Cherry, initially, brought the thrill of warm days. 
However, those warm days had suddenly transformed into a blistering weather condition, leaving me with a runny nose, itchy throat, and persistent chronic cough coupled with the chills. Will the environmental condition of my new habitat change for the better or deteriorate? Only time would tell, I thought. Notwithstanding those times when I found myself traveling toward Mexico, Cuba, Trinidad, and Tobago, a Guyana, even though I had not traveled much before this day, I could mostly picture me going to an England, an Iceland, a Canada. I had indeed traveled to some sub-freezing temperatures and countries. It did not seem that that would have been changing soon, at least not on December 20, 1993. But I had hope and, I in, and an inherent, inherent determination to succeed, if only for my children's sake. I landed at the Pearson's International Airport, Toronto, at about 5.30 p.m. I was out of imagination. I'm sorry, I was out of immigration about 7.30 p.m. I looked around nervously to see if Cherry had come to pick me up for my new abode, but she was not there. I was about to use the telephone booth to call my aunts when I saw one of them, Aunt Almina, also known as Aunt Mina, or Sis, then the next. Aunt Lucille. They were both with their husbands in separate cars. I asked them what they thought I should do since Cherry did not seem to come to receive me. They said I should try to go there. If I did not, she could call immigration on me and I could have been deported, was their argument. That would have messed me up big time, I thought. My hopes of traveling abroad to North America or Europe or any other foreign jurisdiction for that matter would have been nil if that should have happened to me. Just as I was about to board one of the cars to take me to my wife's address, I saw my brother-in-law drive up. He shouted my name. I wanted to return the favor but I could not remember his name. We had only met at the wedding and he was a reserved guy. I introduced him to my aunts and uncles without using his name packed my stuff in his car and it sped off to Cherry's home. Upon my arrival at the house, I noticed my brother-in-law seemed to have been in a hurry. <coughs> Excuse me. He helped me with my luggage and sped off. I was directed to the basement of the house. That's where my wife lived. Upon my seeing Cherry, I walked towards her to hug and kiss her, but she pushed me away. She went to the bathroom, had a shower and went upstairs. I started to cry like a baby. This act was becoming quite regular and ordinary for me. I started to ask myself the reason my life was taking a retrograde step. While I was there thinking, I noticed my wife came back downstairs and got dressed. She went back upstairs shortly after I could hear her calling, the car rolling onto the street. Her son and daughter stayed upstairs. I was just by myself. But even my in-laws came downstairs to see how I was doing. I felt abandoned. I started to think that God had hate. God hated me or worse, that there was probably no God. I asked why else would all those things have been happening to me. I knew I had a good heart for humankind. I knew that I worked hard and that I did everything that I possibly could to move out of my quite humble origin. And that was inundated with all manner of evil, struggle, and setbacks. However, I thought I had overcome all those obstacles, that I was well on my way to conquering the odds, so blatant in my early experiences. I just could not understand why things were once again going downhill with me, with me having no control. I felt a very heavy heart. I thought that I had made too many mistakes in my life. If only I had stuck to my girlfriend studying in Canada or to that young lady I met on the university campus in Kingston, Jamaica. Or best, not indulge in my youthful indiscretion during my marriage to my then wife, Merfelin, the mother of my two beautiful daughters. I would not have found myself being taken for granted and treated like the garbage in the bin at the door I stood staring through. Those were my, those were my unflinching thoughts. I got a shower and changed into some clean clothes. 
television was left on so I just flicked the remote control aimlessly. A couple embracing and being in a romantic mood caught my eyes on one of the channels so I lingered there briefly. I thought I would have been in the position the couple was in now that I had carried out Cherry's original wishes. But it was obviously not meant to be. I was getting too emotional and lonely by the carrying ons of that channel, so I continued clicking up and down the same way I thought my life was. I ran into a wrestling match on another channel. It too reminded me of the life of my life struggles and my current situation with my second wife. I continued clicking. I eventually just dropped the remote on the table and left the television to play. <coughs> Sorry. Psychologically, I was doing the same with my wife, even for the rest of the night. I remember that my brother, Oliver Nelson, had made me a few bottles of rum punch for me to take to Canada. So I reached for my luggage. I got a glass, rinsed it out, and poured me some of it. I drank it and it calmed my spirit a bit. I kept drinking until the bottle was empty. It was about 12.30 a.m. And then my first night in Canada was a real lonely one. Once again, the tears rolled uncontrollably down my wretched face like a car out of control. I was all by myself and I had no, other, no idea where my wife was. She just stepped out and drove away. She did not as much as say, bye, dog. I would be back. I thought I was going to die. The rump punch had helped me some. I laid my head on one of the pillars and fell asleep. For some reason or the other, I woke up about 2 a.m. At first, I forgot where I was. Then I remember that I was in the powerful first world country of Canada. While I lay in the dark, I noticed that there was a light flashing in the dark room. I remember the light that flashed in my bedroom as a child at King's School, and my thoughts went to my father, briefly. However, now I was much more mature. I got up to trace the source of the light and realized that it was coming from the phone. The phone was actually ringing at 2 a.m., but my wife had deliberately turned the ringer off before she left. Hello, I said somewhat unsure of myself. Who is this? The male voice asked. Who are you? I asked. Who the hell are you? The man raised his voice angrily. What do you want? I asked poli politely. Is this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven? He asked. Yes, this is the number, I said. So who the hell are you? He wanted to know. I gave up. We seemed to have been asking each other the same questions for more than two minutes, so I relented. I'm Cherry's husband, I said. What? You are what? He asked again. I am Cherry's husband, I repeated. Cherry is married? He questioned. If I'm her husband, what would you conclude? I asked. The irate man slammed the phone down in my ear. I started to see why it was a problem for me to be with my wife. I felt not only cheated, but I felt like I deserved better than what I had just realized I had been handed. My investigation revealed that the reason Cher was so anxious to get married was simply that her son's father, even though in a relationship with her, had moved in with another woman. She was merely trying to spite him or make him jealous by getting married. Yeah. I understood that she had been intimate with this guy for years, even prior to my stepfather's father, my stepdaughter's father being in the picture. I was also made to understand that no matter what happened between them relationship wise, Cherry would always return to him. I stayed at Cherry's home for approximately two weeks. And for those two weeks I was there, she did not exchange a single word with me. We did not touch each other. She had eggs and bread, etc. in her refrigerator, so I used them to make my breakfast or snacks. Sometimes I would go upstairs to talk to her parents when they were around. Otherwise, I was just a little boy in her bed and basement. At the end of the two weeks, I called my aunt Almina to come to take me out of my misery. And she did. So there you go. Uh, an excerpt from uh, from New Mills to New Life, my autobiography. It's entitled From New Mills to New Life, as I said. It's written by here's Julie Joshua Spencer. And 
this book is available.